Greetings, everybody. Chaplain Bob Walker here, Light of the World Ministries. In John 8, 12, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. This is the continuation of the Ezekiel series for as long as I'm on YouTube. Lord willing, of course. Turn to Ezekiel, and we're going to discuss chapter 17. Now, there is some interesting figures of speech and symbolism in Ezekiel 17. And I have an entire Bible study on eagles' wings. So if you want to go more in-depth, into it, which we're going to get with it very shortly. You could take a look at it. So Ezekiel chapter 17 and verse 1. And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, put forth a riddle, and speak a parable unto the house of Israel. And say, thus saith the Lord God, a great eagle, a great eagle with great wings, long winged, full of feathers, which had divers colors. You know, divers, diverse, many. Came unto Lebanon and took the highest branch of the cedar. So remember that. A great eagle with great wings, long-winged, full of feathers, which had divers colors. So where else do we read about this eagle? Well, let's go to Exodus 19. Now, Remember something. Israel was in bondage to Egypt. They were serving Pharaoh. They were basically Pharaoh of Egypt slaves. And they worked them almost to death. And here's the deal. God sent them Moses. Moses did all those miracles. Till finally the Egyptians said, get out of here. We're tired of all this bad luck. You know. Of course, they didn't believe it was the Lord, but you know. Well, they, they believed. After all those bad things happened, you know. When Moses says, oh, I'm going to bring frogs, and I'm going to bring hail, and I'm going to do this, and I'm going to turn the water into blood, and I'm going to, you know. Which mimics the... Um, Plagues of Revelation, by the way, in many ways. And I did a Bible series on that, too. So let's read. So you got to realize, Moses confronted Pharaoh, did all those miracles, destroyed Egypt pretty much, and now he's leading the children of Israel out of Egypt. Keep that in mind. So let's read Exodus 19. Verse 1, in the third month, when the children of Israel were gone forth out of the land of Egypt, the same day came they into the wilderness of Sinai. And what's the first letter, three letters of Sinai? S-I-N, sin. S-I-N, the wilderness of sin, Sinai. And I wonder if uh, the poison cyanide is uh, somehow related to that. I don't know. Just a thought. Verse 2. For they were departed from Rephidim and were come to the desert of Sinai and had pitched in the wilderness and there Israel camped before the mount. And Moses went up unto God and the Lord called him out of the mountain, saying, 
Thus shalt thou say unto the house of Jacob, and tell the children of Israel. Listen to this carefully. God speaking to Moses. Ye have seen what I did unto the Egyptians. Oh yeah, you saw what I did to the, unto the Egyptians. The plague of hail, the plague of frogs, the plague of lice, the plague of fro flies, uh, the water was turned, the blood, the, the, the Passover where all the firstborn died, except for those that had the blood of the lamb. Sound familiar? Oh yeah. Yeah. Verse 4, ye have seen what I did unto the Egyptians. Now, remember something real quick. Abraham had another son before Isaac called Ishmael from Hagar, who was an Egyptian woman. Remember that. Ishmael was born of Abraham and an Egyptian woman. And God never made his uh, covenant with Ish Ishmael. God made his covenant with Isaac, not Ishmael. God blessed Ishmael for Abraham's sake, but he was not the covenant seed. And his mother was of Egypt. All right, Exodus 19, verse 4. Ye have seen what I did unto the Egyptians and how I bear you on eagles' wings, and how I bear you on eagles' wings, and brought you unto myself. Did God have a, uh, uh, an eagle that was uh, thousands of feet long, and, you know, tens of thousands of Israelites got on the wings, and they flew... Uh, no, I don't think so. There wasn't no Eagle's Wings airline back then. You know, that was bigger than a 747 and a C5A Galaxy. Sorry, Charlie. It's called a figure of speech. God said he bare you on Eagle's Wings and brought you unto myself. Now, therefore, if, oh boy, if, Ye will obey my voice indeed, and keep my covenant. Then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people. For all the earth is mine. And ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests, and an holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. And Moses came and called for the elders of the people and laid before their faces all these words which the Lord commanded him. And all the people answered together and said, All that the Lord hath spoken we will do. Liar, liar, pants on fire. Oh, that's the Bob translation. And Moses returned the words of the people unto the Lord. Oh boy, I don't think so. All right, uh, let's take a look at something here. So the Lord said, If you obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then you shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine, and ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and an holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. You know, in Deuteronomy 14, too, it says, For thou art an holy people unto the Lord thy God, and the Lord hath chosen thee, be, chosen thee to be a peculiar people unto himself above all the nations that are upon the earth. Deuteronomy 26, 18, And the Lord hath avouched thee this day to be his peculiar people, as he hath promised thee, and that thou shouldest keep all his commandments. Psalms 135, 4. For the Lord hath chosen Jacob unto himself, and Israel for his peculiar people. 
Is there a New Testament witness to all this? Oh, yes. 1 Peter 2 and verse 9. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. And in Jesus is that light, right? Oh, yeah. All right, so. So in Exodus 19, 4, the Lord said to Moses, Ye have seen what I have done unto the Egyptians, and how I bear you on eagles' wings and brought you unto myself. Eagles' wings. All right, let's take a look at Deuteronomy. 32. Uh, Deuteronomy 32, verse 7. Remember the days of old. Consider the years of many generations. Ask thy father, and he will show thee. Thy elders, and they will tell thee. When the Most High divided to the nations their inheritance. See, the Lord divided the nations. When the Most High divided to the nations their inheritance. When he separated the sons of Adam. See, the Lord separated the people. The modern day world wants us to all mixed be mixed together. I, you know, they want you to think, oh, y'all, God made a mistake. He separated all the people. Now um, we gotta undo that mistake by mixing everybody up. You know. No. God separated the people. The Lord did. You know, if you want to know what the Bible uh what their view on a subject is. It's real simple. Just see what the world is doing and do the opposite. Because the world is always does the opposite of what the Bible says. I mean, really. If the Bible says abortion, or if the Bible, if the world says abortion, you know the Bible's against it. If the world practices Harry Potter witchcraft, you know the Bible's against it. Never fails. Everything the Bible's for, the, the world is against. And everything the world is for, the Bible's against. Never fails. Deuteronomy 32, verse 8. When the Most High divided to the nations their inheritance, when he separated the sons of Adam, he set the bounds of the people according to the number of the children of Israel. For the Lord's portion is his people, Jacob is the lot of his inheritance. Jacob is Israel. It was Abraham, Isaac, not Ishmael. And then Isaac through Jacob, not Esau. Boy, that is a very important thing. Uh, you can't get churches. All these so-called churches that believe what they call universalism why do they teach universalism so that they can flood our countries with every heathen alien in the world why why everybody can be saved god wants everybody to be saved really uh does god want esau to be saved god says he hated esau you know, does God want Satanists to be saved? How about Satan? Why not Satan too? I mean, you know, that's why they teach this universalism. Because if people knew that the covenant was exclusive, they might say, hey, wait a minute. Why are our lands being flooded with all these heathen aliens? They're not part of the covenant. 
You know? For the Lord's portion is his people. Jacob is the lot of his inheritance. Verse 10. He found him in a desert land and in the waste howling wilderness. He led him about. He instructed him. He kept him as the apple of his eye. Another Bible saying, right? Listen uh, carefully. Verse 11. As an eagle, as an eagle stirreth up her nest, fluttereth over her young, spreadeth abroad her wings, taketh them, beareth them on her wings. So the Lord alone did lead him, and there was no strange God with him. He made him ride on the high places of the earth, that he might eat the increase of the fields, he made him to suck honey out of the rock and oil out of the flinty rock. As an eagle stirreth up her nest, fluttereth over her young, spreadeth abroad her wings, taketh them, beareth them on her wings. Eagle's wings. Very important. All right, let's take a look at Isaiah chapter 40. Uh, if memory serves me correctly, there's 39 books in the Old Testament. And Isaiah is kind of like a mini Bible. 66 books in the Bible, 66 chapters in Isaiah. Generally, the first 39 chapters in Isaiah, if I remember correctly, are very harsh. Judgment, just like Jeremiah, just like Ezekiel. But from verse uh, chapter 40 to 66 is more like reconciliation and repentance. And I believe... There's more prophecy and uh, quotes in the New Testament from Isaiah than any other book in the Bible. I mean, Jesus, what did Jesus do? Uh, first thing, when he went to the synagogue. Oh, I guess I ought to do that. Let me check it out. Let's go to Luke 4, 14. Luke chapter 4, verse 14. And Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit into Galilee, and there went out a fame, 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 famous, a fame of him through all the region round about. And he taught in their synagogues, being glorified of all. And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah, Isaiah, that's the Greek rendering of Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. Verse 18. He's Jesus speaking here. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind. Uh, the spiritually blind and the physically blind, both. Jesus restored the sight to quite a few blind people. And recovering of sight to the blind to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book, and he gave it again to the minister and sat down. And the eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. Yeah, everybody's looking at Jesus. And he began to say unto them, this day is this scripture fulfilled in 
your ears. And all bear him witness and wondered at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. And they said, is not this Joseph's son? You know. And he said unto them, now remember, Joseph was a carpenter. And they're like, wait a minute, this guy's just a carpenter's son. What is, you know, what's he talking about here? And he said unto them, ye shall surely say unto me this proverb, Physician, heal thyself. Whatsoever we have heard done in Capernaum, do also here in thy country. And he said, Verily I say unto you, No prophet, no prophet is accepted in his own country. But I tell you of a truth, many widows were in Israel in the days of Elias, Elijah, when the heaven was shut up three years and six months, and when great famine was throughout all the land. Uh, three years and six months. That's 42 months, people. Revelation, the, um, the time of Jacob's trouble is going to be 42 months. Three and a half years. 1,260 days, approximately. Ties in together. But I tell you of a truth, many widows were in Israel in the days of Elias, when the heaven was shut up three years and six months, when great famine was throughout all the land. That's right. Elijah um, shut the heavens. No rain for three and a half years. Even the cactus would have a tough time with that, buddy. And great famine was throughout all the land. But unto none of them was Elias sent, save unto Sarepta, a city of Sidon, unto a woman that was a widow. And many lepers were in Israel in the time of Eliseus the prophet, and none of them was cleansed, saving Naaman the Syrian. See, very, very the remnant, the remnant is very small. The remnant was very small, very small. And all they in the synagogue, when they heard these things, were filled with wrath. They were mad. How dare you speak to us that way? Who do you think you are, carpenter's son? And they rose up and thrust him out of their city and led him under the brow of the hill whereon their city was built, that they might cast him down headlong. But he, passing through the midst of them, went his way. So, there you go. Uh, let me see here. All right, back to Isaiah 40. I guess we'll do verse 29. Boy, I, uh, I haven't even started Ezekiel and I'm already 20, almost 25 minutes in. This is going to be a long study. I knew it would be, just looking at everything. You know, sometimes I think, oh, I can do this thing in about 15, 20 minutes. It ends up being an hour, you know. Verse 29, Isaiah 40. He giveth power to the faint, and to them that have no might, he increaseth strength. Even the youths shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fail. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. Oh, this is a wonderful verse. Let's, they shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. Let's read that again. Isaiah 40, 31. You know, the first 39 chapters of Isaiah is really judgment. But from 40 on to 66, it's more about reconciliation, just like the New Testament. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run 
and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. All right, let's go to Revelation chapter 12. Um, and let's see, where am I going to start here? You know, I've read Revelation chapter 12 so many times, uh, but I don't want to, I don't want to read the whole chapter. If, if, uh, if you're interested, you know, do a channel search, Revelation 12. I've done it many, many times. Um, let's see. Revelation 12, 7. And there was past tense. I know a lot of people say, oh, this is future. This is future. No, people. This happened in the past. Revelation, I mean, uh, read Revel uh, Genesis. Read Genesis 2 and 3. In Genesis 2, God says everything he made was good. And then in Genesis 3, you got the devil lying. This is past, and there was, was, not there will be, or there is, no, and there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels, and prevailed not, neither was their place found any more in heaven, and the great dragon was cast out. Remember, Jesus said, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. And that was around 2,000 years ago when he spoke those words. It's past. It's not the future. I, I just, it aggravates me. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Oh, yeah. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now has come salvation and strength, and the kingdom of our God, and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accuseth them before our God day and night. And they, the church, and they overcame him, the devil, by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto the death. Therefore rejoice, ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea. For the devil has come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. That's why things are going so fast. And uh, by the way, today is April 6, 2021. I am utterly amazed at how things have changed in the last year. Absolutely. Remember, they was like, oh yeah, there's... We're going to shut down for two weeks. Well, we're, we're starting the second year. They said two weeks, but really, <laughs> they meant at least two years. And two years is going to become two decades, if they have that long. Because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. And when the dragon saw that he was cast under the earth, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man-child. And to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle. There's that eagle again. And to the woman. And who's this woman? The church. This woman is the church. The bride of Christ. And to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness, into her place where she is nourished for a time, a year, and times, two years, and half a time, half a year, 
That's three and a half years. 42 months. And to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness, into her place, where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time from the face of the serpent. And the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood. I got an hour and a half study on this, if anybody's interested. The flood is... Uh, the heathens. Verse 16, And the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed up the flood, which the dragon cast out of his mouth. And the dragon was wroth, angry with the woman, and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Oh, yeah. Okay, let's go back to Ezekiel 17. Boy, we have barely, we've barely even touched Ezekiel, and it's already half an hour. Verse 1, I guess. We'll start from the beginning. Ezekiel 17, 1. And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, put forth a riddle, and speak a parable unto the house of Israel, and say, Thus saith the Lord God, a great eagle with great wings, long-winged, full of feathers, which had divers colors, came unto Lebanon and took the highest branch of the cedar. Uh, you should read Ezekiel 31 if you want to know about this branch of the cedar. He cropped off the top of his young twigs and carried it into a land of traffic. He set it in a city of merchants. He took also of the seed of the land and planted it in a fruitful field. He placed it by great waters and set it as a willow tree. And it grew and became a spreading vine of low stature, whose branches turned toward him and the roots thereof were under him. So it became a vine and brought forth branches and shot forth sprigs. Now remember, um, now let me take a look. Now, in Hosea 10.1, it says, Israel is an empty vine. Didn't we just read about a vine? Oh, yeah. Israel is an empty vine. He bringeth forth fruit unto himself according to the multitude of his fruit. He hath increased the altars according to the goodness of his land. They have made goodly images. All right, what is this vineyard? Uh, Isaiah 5, 7 tells you. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel. Isaiah 5, 7, for the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel and the men of Judah, his pleasant plant. And he looked for judgment, but behold, oppression for righteousness, but behold, a cry. Get the picture? The vineyard is Israel. All right, Ezekiel 17, 6. And it grew and became a spreading vine of low stature, whose branches tur turned toward him, and the roots thereof were under him. So it became a vine and brought forth branches and shot forth sprigs. Verse 7. Here's this eagle again. There was also another great eagle with great wings and many feathers. And behold, this vine did bend her roots toward him, and shot forth her branches toward him, that he might water it by the furrows of her plantation. It was planted in a good soil by great waters, that it might bring forth branches, and that it might bear fruit, that it might be a goodly vine. What did Jesus say about bearing fruit? You know, good fruit. 
A believer bears forth good fruit because they're a believer. You don't bear fruit to become a believer. You bear fruit because you are a believer. Apple trees produce apples, or they should. If they don't, you cut them down and you plant something else, right? All right, so Ezekiel 17, 8, it was planted in a good soil by great waters. So it had water and it had good dirt. Just what you need for good crops, right? Of course, this is a parable. That it might bring forth branches and that it might bear fruit, that it might be a goodly vine. Verse 9. Say thou, thus saith the Lord God, Shall it prosper? Shall he not pull the roots thereof and cut off the fruit thereof? Well, if there's evil fruit, pull it up, right? And cut off the fruit thereof that it wither. It shall wither in all the leaves of her spring, even without great power or many people to pluck it up by the roots thereof. Yea, behold, being planted, shall it prosper. Shall it not utterly wither when the east wind toucheth it? It shall wither in the furrows where it grew. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, verse 12. Now, here's what they're really talking about. Say now to the rebellious house... Who's a rebellious house? Israel and Judah. Say now to the rebellious house, Know ye, know ye not what these things mean? Don't you know what I'm talking about here? I'm not talking about grape vines. I'm talking about Israel. Well, that's the Bob commentary. Say now to the rebellious house, Know ye not what these things mean? Tell them, Behold, the king of Babylon is come to Jerusalem, and hath taken the king thereof and the princes thereof, and led them with him to Babylon. And Babel means confusion. Remember the Tower of Babel? Oh yeah, confusion. What is Babylon? Confusion. Verse 13, and led them with him to Babylon and have taken of the king's seed. And no, we're not talking about tomato plants. The king's seed, his children. And hath taken of the king's seed and made a covenant with him and hath taken an oath of him. He hath also taken the mighty of the land that the kingdom might be base. What does that mean? base uh, a base of a foundation is the lowest spot if you go to buy a base model of a vehicle it's stripped bare it's the lowest thing you can buy the cheapest model right that the kingdom might be base that it might not lift itself up but that by keeping of his covenant it might stand but did Israel keep the covenant? No, uh-uh. Did Judah? No, uh-uh. Verse 15. But he rebelled against him in sending his ambassadors into Egypt, that they might give him horses and much people. You see, the king of Judah, instead of getting on his hands and knees in prayer and sackcloth and ashes and repentance unto the Lord and begging the Lord to protect him and turning from his wickedness. They said, I'm going to go to Egypt. I'm going to ask the Egyptians to help. And the Lord doesn't say anything good about Egypt that I know of. Absolutely nothing. Every time I see Egypt in the Bible, it's a bad thing with all their heathen, satanic gods. Yeah, Set, the sun god. Yeah. 
you know, I cannot find not one place in the Bible where Egypt is spoken of nicely. That's why Israel wandered in the desert for 40 years. Not only did the Lord take Israel out of Egypt, he was trying to take Egypt out of Israel. So did the king of Judah repent? The king of Jerusalem? No. He went to Egypt. I'm going to trust Egypt. I'm not going to ask the Lord. Uh -uh, I'm going to ask Egypt. But he, the king of Jerusalem, but he rebelled against him in sending his ambassadors into Egypt that they might give him horses and much people. Shall he prosper? The answer is no. Shall he escape that doeth such things? Or shall he break the covenant and be delivered? You're going to break God's covenant and think you're going to survive? I don't think so. Verse 16. As I live, saith the Lord God, surely in the place where the king dwelleth, that made him king, whose oath he despised, and whose covenant he brake, even with him in the midst of Babylon shall he die. What oath? I'm sure the king swore on a Bible, you know, just like you do in court. Do you swear to tell the truth and nothing but the truth so help you God? And if they ask you that question uh, in court, say, uh, Sir, what is the name of this God that I'm swearing to? That will really throw a monkey wrench into the works. What's the name of this God that I'm swearing to, sir? Am I swearing to Satan? Who am I swearing to? So the king made an oath that he despised and he broke the covenant. And what happened? The Lord sent him to Babylon to die. Verse 6, 17. Neither shall Pharaoh with his mighty army and great company make for him in the war by casting up mounts and building forts to cut off many persons. Seeing he despised the oath by breaking the covenant, when lo, he had given his hand and done all these things, he shall not escape. Nope, the king of Judah is not going to escape. Verse 19, Therefore thus saith the Lord God, As I live, surely mine oath that he hath despised, and my covenant that he hath broken, even it will I recompense upon his own head. Oh yeah, payback. Verse 20, and I will spread my net upon him, and he shall be taken in my snare, and I will bring him to Babylon, and will plead with him there for his trespass, that he hath trespassed against me. And all his fugitives with all his bands shall fall by the sword, and they that remain shall be scattered up toward all winds. And ye shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken it. Thus saith the Lord God, I will also take of the highest branch of the high cedar and will set it. I will crop off from the top of his young twigs a tender one and will plant it upon a high mountain and eminent. Now this is a very important prophecy. People, I, I'm going to show you another prophecy prophecy but keep this in mind the Lord's going to take a young tender twig and plant it upon a high mountain and eminent keep that in mind verse 23 in the mountain of the height of Israel will I plant it and it shall bring forth boughs and bear fruit bear fruit and be a goodly cedar and under it shall dwell all fowl of every wing in the shadow of the branches thereof they shall they dwell and all the trees of the field shall know that I the Lord have brought down the high tree 
and have exalted the low tree, have dried up the green tree, and have made the dry tree to flourish. I, the Lord, have spoken and done it, have done it. All right, let's go to Ezekiel 21 real quick. Verse 25. And thou profane wicked prince of Israel, whose day is come when iniquity shall have an end. Thus saith the Lord God, remove the diadem. What's a diadem? Well, according to Webster's 1828, it's a headband worn by kings as a badge of royalty made of silk, uh, fine linen, tied around the temples and foreheads. And uh, in modern usage, a mark or badge of royalty worn on the head, a crown or a principal ornament. So it could be like a crown. So, in Ezekiel 21, the wicked, the profane wicked prince is told, well, you're, di you're going to remove the diadem and take off the crown. This shall not be the same. Exalt him that is low and abase him that is high. Isn't that what Jesus said? Basically, yeah. In James 4 and verse 10, it says, Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. In Matthew 23, 12, Jesus said, And whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased. So if you lift yourself up, you're going to be pushed down. And whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased, and he that shall humble himself shall be exalted. You bring yourself low, the Lord will lift you up. So, Ezekiel 21, 26. Thus saith the Lord God, now he's talking about the wicked profane prince, right? Remove the diadem and take off the crown. This shall not be the same. Exalt him that is low and abase him that is high. Listen carefully. 27. I will overturn, overturn, overturn it three times. And it shall be no more until he come whose right it is, and I will give it him. Now, there is a scholar, I can't remember, it might be E. Raymond Capt. But uh, according to legend, Jeremiah took the daughters of Judah, the princesses, Tiatifa, went to Ireland, where she married the king of Ireland. And then the, the crown went from Ireland to Scotland. And who was the king of Scotland? There was a guy named James. Perhaps you've heard of him. King James? Yeah, he authorized a Bible. So what happened? Overturned Judah? Overturned Ireland? Overturned it to Scotland? And then it ended up in England. I don't know how true that is, but you know what? It makes sense in light of Bible prophecy. And of course, your demon nominational churches will say, oh, that can't be true. Well, then ask them, explain it. Ah, uh, 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 uh. oh, oh, wait a minute. Hey, look, the football game's on. Yeah, they can't explain it. All they can do is tell you, oh, no, that's not true. Because they don't want us to know our heritage. They don't want you to know who you are. Why, anybody could be saved. Liars. So, what can I tell you? 
I think it was E. Raymond capped. I'm not sure. But uh, the uh, crown was overturned, overturned, overturned. And then King James gave us the wonderful Bible in 1611. Now, he didn't have anything to do with translating it, but uh, you know what? And people say all kinds of bad things about him. Do you know you could read King James's writings on Bible subjects to this day? Yeah. The guy was a scholar. He really was. I mean, you know, the king, you know, the average peasant may not have known how to read and write, but I'm telling you the king would. And he, you should read some of his writings. When people tell you, oh, well, he was a Mason, and he was a, a Jesuit, you know, tell those people to go to hell. Because either they're deceivers or they're deceived. But either way, they're a bunch of garbage. King James was a scholar and a believer. I mean, after all, you know, the Spanish... Uh, the Catholic Spanish fleet, they tried to stop the Bible from being printed. And Spain was absolutely the most powerful nation in the world at that time. And they sent their fleet. And if you look on a world map, Spain is not far from England. It's not far at all. I mean, it's, you know, but the Spanish, the Spanish Armada, I forget how many ships it was, full of troops. I mean, absolutely full of troops. And when England got hold of all this, they proclaimed a fast and prayer. And, and guess what? A storm came and scattered the Spanish fleet. Matter of fact, they even uh, printed, minted a coin in commemoration of this it said god blew and they were scattered and guess what spain uh never again would uh try to stop england from printing the bible didn't happen well about 20 something years afterwards Spain tried to challenge England again. But England had a guy named Lord Nelson, Admiral Lord Nelson. And he whipped the Spanish fleet at the Battle of Trafalgar. And after that, Spain was finished as a world power, pretty much. And England, uh, they had a saying, England ruled the waves. And you know what? Up until World War II, that was pretty much true. At the end of World War II, you know who had the largest navy in the world? The United States. I read accounts of sailors that uh, said that in the final year of the war, that the fleet sailing to whatever, to battle, they could be on a ship and look from horizon to horizon, all 360 degrees, and all you could see was ships. Do you know that America had over 100 aircraft carriers alone, just aircraft carriers, at the war end of World War II? No telling how many submarines. No money telling how many cruisers and destroyers and support ships and liberty ships. I mean, it's absolutely amazing. I'm something of a World War II amateur historian. But the United States had the largest navy in the world. But guess what? Before we shipped all our uh, factories over to China for free trade, 
under uh, Bush and Clinton, China had nothing. Do you know China now has a, a large deep water navy? China has more submarines than the United States does. Yeah. Our good friends in the Middle East gave them a German Dolphin-class submarine that they were able to copy. And I'm sure they gave them the blueprints and everything. Yeah. Our friends in the Middle East. Yeah. You know who. And his name doesn't start with Muhammad either. So. All right. Uh, God's judgment upon a wicked nation. What can I tell you? So. All right. Well, this is the end of Ezekiel 17. All blessings, praise, glory, and honor to God the Father and His only begotten Son, Jesus, who is the Christ, the Lamb of God slain from the foundation of the world. All blessings, praise, glory, and honor in Jesus' precious name. Amen.